you know, are just are excited about talking about this subject and, um, and and thinking through a little bit some of the issues and challenges uh, associated with embedding and weaving a, uh, a change capability into the organization. I sort of wanted to start with the notion of, you know, organizations today, your organization, almost every organization is probably thinking about how do I, how do I adjust? How do I adapt? How do I um, respond to a technological change, a competitor challenge, uh, the shifting uh, economic environment, uh, uh, volatility in the commodity prices? Everybody's trying to figure out how, how to adjust their existing operations and strategies and processes and supply chains to handle and, and, and deal with those changes. I think that's something everybody deals with. What Sue and I wanted to talk about was, was shifting the thinking a little bit and moving from simply adapting to a set of uh, challenges to what would it take for an organization to design itself in such a way that it could adapt to those any change that came along and that that adaptation process was sort of normal. Um, and that's kind of the theme of, of the webinar today is to, is to say what would the ingredients of an organization that is able to adjust and adapt continuously look like. Um, when we think about it, and so and I, for those of you who were uh, lurking in the, the previous, uh, before we got started, you know, Sue and I were exchanging a bunch of emails in, in thinking about the webinar and preparing for the, uh, for the seminar in June. And I, I think we sort of hit on two issues. If you're going to become a truly adaptable, agile organization and make that transformation, you're going to have to think about two things. I want to, would, I want to address really quickly uh, setting up an appropriate context. There, there has to be some design issues. There has to be some ways of thinking about strategy that, that set the context in the organization and send signals to people that change is the thing that we do around here, change is what's normal. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sue and ask Sue to sort of talk about there's, in addition to this context, there has to be a set of routines in the organization. There has to be a way of thinking about setting up centers of excellence so that, that they are uh, designed in such a way to encourage the organization to change. And you also have to have a way of thinking about change that's different um, from traditional change processes. The, the old ones just won't work anymore. And so we have to think about what those new processes might be. Welcome to the dog in the you know, background. Love to hear that. Uh, <laughs> um, so let me talk about the context piece a little bit, and then we'll, uh, Sue will talk about the change uh, requirements, and then we'll have Becky uh, give us uh, give us her experience as uh, as she's tried to think through this this problem at Oracle. Um, when Sue and I think about organizations that are adaptable, we try and think about and, and use the term agility. And we suggest that, that, that agile organizations are, is, a, is a capability that sits at, a, at the top of the pyramid. And, and the job of uh, agile routines is to help change the capabilities of the organization. And those capabilities rest on a set of good management practices, uh, ways of thinking about the way the organization is designed. And for those of you that know Sue and I, uh, you'll, you'll not be surprised to, to, to to hear that we think that foundation rests really strongly on the STAR model. And so we, we talk about uh, designing organizations that are built to change as opposed to uh, favoring stability and, and being able to uh, design an organization that is not only fit for its function and, and aligns to strategy, but also is flexible and fast enough to make the adjustments that are necessary in today's kind of crazy VUCA world. So we very much see design as a key to that context. Uh, in order for an organization to uh, change routinely, it has to be designed for change, and, and we see the STAR model as kind of the, the real basic uh, core part of that. When you, when you start from, the, from that context then, one of the things that, that we advocate, one of the things we believe strongly is that an organization's culture is the outcome of the choices you make around strategy, structure, people, work design, management processes. We see those, each of those elements of the STAR model as 
as sending signals to people about how they're supposed to behave, as sending signals and expectations about what's normal. So if you, if you have a structure that's siloed and unintegrated, it sends a signal to people that you just pay attention to your own world and don't pay attention to other functions or business units or the external environment. If you have management processes that don't uh, support cross-functional work, it's sending a signal to people, don't worry about that. If you reward people for getting um, certain things done and you don't reward them for changing, it sends signals to people. And when you pull those things together, you get a certain kind of behavior, you get a certain kind of performance in the organization, and that reinforces and produces a certain kind of culture. If the culture says change is not important, the organization is going to have some struggle uh, in trying and adapting on a routine basis. So I'm just trying to reinforce here the notion that, that design is a key part of the context in thinking about um, setting up an organization for change. The, the, the second piece of that I think is important for um, setting this context, and it follows from this notion of, of culture, is we see one of the key responsibilities of a senior leadership team, a senior functional team, uh, a senior business team. One of their jobs is to manage the climate of the organization, to manage the way the organization thinks about who it is. And we, we tend to use the word identity here, to borrow uh, Mary Jo Hatch's term. And, and that identity uh, is, a, is a product of the culture, which we understand now is a, is a function of the, of the organization's design. But it's more than that. It's also a, a product of the way the organization um, communicates with the external environment and tells the external environment about who it is and what its brand promise is. And, and, and the, the marketplace, customers, regulators, uh, suppliers get to interact with us as an organization, they begin to understand this is who we are, this is, this is who we say we are, and then does the organization actually behave that way? And so in the, in the course, we'll talk about this identity as a, as a really key responsibility of senior management, and, and they have to set this context. Um, they set the context through the design, through, through sending signals to people about the importance of change, and then resulting in an identity that defines who we are, and in particular, it defines who we are in terms of being changeable. And, and, it, and it sort of pushes the organization, it pushes the or people in the organization to think about change and to see that as something normal, not something that's different or uh, unusual or something to be avoided. Change is something to be embraced. Um, and so that's the, con the contextual issues, I think, that are associated with uh, continuously changing organizations. And if I could hand it over to Sue, I'd like her to sort of talk about some of these processes that are necessary inside the organization and within this context to support the organization and change. Sue, can you kind of pick it up from there? I will. Thanks, Chris. Yep. And uh, a second welcome to all of you. For uh, Thank you for being with us today. One of the things that we, Chris and I, have really started focusing on in our own research and in our own thinking is how do organizations really assemble the uh, organization design resources is what we started out with to be agile in today's environment. And um, we quickly learned that we needed to expand that to the organizational change uh, resources as well. And the reason for that is that when you change designs, and if you're agile, you're changing designs a little bit or a lot, almost all the time, um, there needs to be a, a capability just completely built in, woven in, hence the name of our seminar, to the, to the organization um, so that that doesn't become an event that requires a 17-step change process, but rather is something where you can pull together uh, the resources quickly and determine the steps quickly that need to be taken and take them um, as part of the ongoing operation of the organization. And so we've been working with a number of organizations that say we want to do that. We want to build that in, both in terms of org design and in terms of organizational change. And um, they find that they, they face a lot of challenges in doing that. Now, our model that we've used for 30 years at CEO 
Um, it actually is a model that Tom Cummings worked with me and we developed back in the 1980s when companies were um, really doing fundamental shifts around um, flattening the organization, embracing new uh, information technology, and, and um, addressing really new performance pressures that, that they were experiencing in a rapidly globalizing business environment. And um, basically, our self-design model says that companies can't just copy what other companies do, but they need to build in the capability to carry out this cycle, which is strategy-driven, and when strategy changes, then the, strat the cycle will get initiated. Um, and it, it relies on learning about your organization, what it's capable of doing, what it isn't, and diagnosing uh, very quickly its, its capabilities and the extent to which the organization design itself is out of whack with what the organization needs to be able to do, quickly generating the criteria for that design, and then going through a very rapid design process. You'll see that box is kind of small because our belief is that if you build the capabilities for design into the organization, and if you build the capabilities to lay the foundation continually and continually um, be uh, a, a, attending to what's going on in the, in the market environment, where your strategy needs to change, and um, uh, where your organization has gotten out of whack with what's required of it, that the designing process ought to become fairly routine. Um, not necessarily simple, because um, we think that design has a, um, a set of, of expertise associated with it, and, and the organization has to know how to do that. And then as it implements and, ass and assesses things, which it should be doing almost continuously in a VUCA environment, um, it will uh, send the organization back to realizing things are still out of whack or the strategy isn't accomplishing what they would like it to do. And we see this as an ongoing process. And if you take a complex organization, it's probably going on um, independently um, in lots of parts of the organization and probably lots of parts of the organization at the same time. You've probably got multiple of these change cycles happening simultaneously, which is one of the reasons um, it's so c complex and it's hard to get uh, management attention uh, to change in today's world. Um, the, uh, the outcome of this is pretty well established through research, which is if you can get that design right, it, yields the core capabilities that you need in today's environment and the organizational capabilities that sort of underpin and that's, that's kind of what Chris has referred to as a, a, a solid management. Um, there's really three parts of, of this transition and um, uh, we deal mostly with the organization design, implementation and learning piece. Um, the talent and knowledge piece has been the purview historically of the human resource function. The other two parts, I think, are rapidly becoming the purview of HR and or strategy in the organization. Um, but there is a knowledge and talent issue associated with the capability to be agile and to change that has sort of remained hidden. And in fact, we see organizations, when they experience cost crises, um, routinely getting rid of that talent. Um, because they really don't understand the role that it plays in allowing the organization to be agile. So that's one of the things we've been exploring is what, is, what are the talent and knowledge issues uh, that are required for ongoing organization design, implementation, and learning. Um, in the course of, of working with org design, we realized that um, given the VUCA environment, given that org design is happening many places in the organization simultaneously, um, that you don't get done with one change before another change is upon you, um, that the linear change models that we've relied on for a very long time, and you can name probably 10 of them, that, and one of those is, is a model that perhaps your company has adopted, um, really don't work very well. They're too long, they're too cumbersome. A lot of the steps um, and, the, and the Gantt charts and the, and the, the um, uh, various kinds of schedules and the roll-down procedures, et cetera, are just too slow for the kind of change that we need to build. It needs to be much more a set of processes. And um, this, is, this is a picture of the change model that we've derived from research. Um, and it really fits in nicely, if you know Chris's agility model, to agility in that it starts with awareness, constant awareness of what's going on in the environment and, and, and um, the uh, intent to adapt to, to be able to deal with those 
um, changes that are occurring or to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are afforded. Um, ongoing either tweaks or large changes to design um, in order to be able to, to develop new capabilities once you're aware of what you need to do. Um, you never get the design right the first time, and so there's constant tailoring. The design doesn't necessarily fit all parts of the world, so there's constant tailoring. And then there's the ongoing monitoring. Did you get it right? What else do you need to do? And those things, we, we don't draw them uh, linearly. We don't think they are linear. We think they happen uh, through constant engagement of people in these four different processes that are tightly linked in a change capability. Um, and we think that uh, it's constantly linked together through a learning process of discovering what the solution might be to what you're facing at a point in time, and that if you're effective at, at um, dealing with the agile world, become, being agile and dealing with the agility requirements, and if you're effective at being able to change regularly, routinely, um, that um, this learning has to occur across the organization. So there, that part of the model is how do we make sure the learning occurs and that that's just as in, important as um, uh, the steps of change or the elements of change and so forth. So um, I'd like to introduce Becky um, Spears, who is both a, a long-term friend of, of the center um, a participant and faculty member in our organization design program, um, has obviously her role, important role, first at Sun as a, as a sponsor, a uh, partner of ours, and then now at, now at Oracle, and who has been leading a group um, participating in the attempt to build in these capabilities at Oracle, at Oracle, and she's going to be speaking about how they've approached it and in particular, she's going to be speaking about um, the introduction of the concepts of agility into the organization. And she's going to talk a little bit about the very specific context of Oracle, which um, uh, creates quite a challenge for getting any kind of, of, of widespread agreement about direction across the organization. So Becky, thank you for joining us. And um, we're looking forward to, your, to what you're going to pre be presenting. OK, thank you, Sue. So um, I'm going to just be talking about, I'm going to be talking about building organization agility at Oracle. And to talk about that, I just wanted to give you an idea of a little bit about Oracle. Um, our goal is to simplify the information technology for companies. Um, we're, right now, the big terms are cloud, big data, engineered systems. Um, we have this underlying stack that is sitting underneath that cloud picture. And we actually sell pieces of this to anyone who wants just a piece. And we work with other companies that may be putting the rest of their system together. Or you can buy the entire stack from us, which is integrated. And in the past, what this meant was that your company would buy our stuff, and then you would operate it as you operated your business. What's changing with the cloud is that now we also have a part of our business where we will operate the stuff. So we have these clouds we're managing. And it's made for a really dynamic, um, constantly changing evol evolvement or evolution of our business model. If you read any of the talk today about Oracle, what all the analysts are looking at is how much cloud business are we generating? How are we making the move to cloud? And they're comparing us to our competitors. But we still need to manage the other piece, which is people are still buying the stack from us, and they're still running it themselves, or they're buying a piece of it. So it's become a very complex, um, evolving situation. So who we are, um, I'm part of the OD consulting group. And it's a global OD consulting team. And it's called the ODC, which standing for Organization Development Consultants. And we have people around the world. It's, I don't remember the exact count right now, but it's in the 40 range. And this is showing you where the people are. And the other thing that is really key here is we support Oracle's lines of business. There's a term LOB, lines of business, and they apply it to any significant business entity. So we have lots of lines of business. And the way Oracle operates is they try to put autonomy in the lines of business so that they can go pursue the business and get, get what they need to do. And so there isn't a lot of common. 
um, things going on. It's the most decentralized company that, that I've experienced, and it's also global, and so it's very, very complex. For our team, we've got people supporting the different LOBs. We've got people working across Oracle. Uh, we do a lot of um, virtual type of engagement. My team is actually a virtual team, the team that works with me on developing the OD consulting practice. The members actually report to an LOB lead within the OD consulting group. And so one of the things we've really struggled with as a consulting team is this global piece. And we've tried various different approaches to it. What we find most useful right now is we try to put people from two different regions on any given team where we're trying to do something because that just makes it more manageable in terms of when you can meet. We also have Oracle Social Network, which is a social networking system that we can use and we'll create a conversation for that initiative, and that allows us to reach out globally. So we've, we're still evolving with this. It is, it is one of our, our big challenges. We also have some significant differences in the business. Um, some of these different countries, we need to operate very differently, and what we provide in one area might be different than what we provide or offer in, it, in another area. So it's actually a pretty complex consulting team. We have this, these three stacks. The company is based on this stack, and we have developed OD, or, or, or OD consulting offerings. We've got three stacks. And the one on the left, which is organization development consulting, is the one I'm really very focused on. But the consultants also deliver, deliver talent management and we're the front end for any development programs. Um, we may even create some. That's what the custom solutions is referring to. So we have a pretty broad set of things we offer people. What's been happening in our business, I would say starting about two years ago, maybe it was even before that, this concept of organization agility started becoming very well known. The leaders in the company, the people in the company are very highly trained professionals. A lot of them have master's degrees, some have PhDs, many of them have quite a bit of experience, and they're actively out there reading articles. So it's not like they wait for us to point a direction. That we, we are sensing them all the time and trying to figure out what they're talking about. And the concept of organization agility was just really becoming a, um, something that everybody was talking about. So Christine Barnes, who's, an, who's one of the leaders of one of the LOB teams in the OD Consulting Group, and I attended the Beyond Change Management workshop that Sue and Chris put on. I think it was like, I know it was at least a year ago. I don't remember when it was, but probably close to a year and a half ago. And when we attended that, it was like immersing us into all of the methodology and everything we could possibly use in figuring this out for Oracle. And we came back from that session. We put together a team, including Paula Day, who's a consultant in, the Asia, in Asia, and Sandy Ellington, who's one of the people who puts out our, who creates some of our leadership development, et cetera. And we got them together, and we came up with this solution um, I'm going to show you a few pages from it. I'm obviously not going to show you the full solution, but our primary goal was to figure out how do we introduce and define and build awareness around what is organization agility and how does that relate to change management. Um, our goal was to change the conversation because the conversation was going all over the place based on whatever anybody had read recently and was passing around for others to read. We also built in some options so that if a consultant takes this solution and they're working with a line of business and they actually have a change or they have something going on and they really have some appetite about doing more, they could go into more interaction. We also figured that this can be combined with some of our other solutions. So it was set up to be, as a minimum, this awareness raising, but also to build into something more active. This slide is one that we, with different text, used throughout our solution. We sort of borrowed the graphics from Chris, and at the time we went to the session, he had more on his page than what we have here, but we messed around with it. And we really like this, this showing the difference between episodic change and continuous change. That is really easy for people to grasp. They see it, they're living it, they get it. The thing that 
we use it to make a point with at the same time as it used to be we were trying to get back to stability because that made us effective and change was like an enemy. You didn't want that. You would resist the disruption of change. With the continuous change that we're living in today, change is what makes you effective. If you're sitting still, if you're being stable, that's bad. That's the enemy. Um, if you're not changing, you're going to be left behind, and that's definitely happening in our business world. So this slide really resonates with our business clients. We also have, and this is an optional one, but one of the things we do as an example to make it real, we go through some a case study with Fujifilm, we go through that page, then we talk about what are you seeing today in this VUCA world. And VUCA was running around as a term at Oracle before we started doing this, but it's just continually grown. And so being able to actually make them look at what does VUCA mean, don't just say VUCA, and how is this affecting your business? But this is optional. The other page we sometimes use is we have a page with quotes from the business leaders and, and even a quote from the LOB leader. And we then ask them the same question, but we don't delve so much into VUCA, but this is, this is one of our options. After we've had a discussion about their business and what's going on, we put this slide in front of them, and it's, you know, a chameleon, and we ask them, what is it the chameleons do to survive? And this is really effective because most people will say, well, they change color. But, you know, actually what they do is they scan the environment, they analyze what is needed, and they change color. And one of the things that we see people wanting to do to become more agile is they just want to rush into it. Like, oh, if I do these things, I'll be as fast as the competition, and I'll get there. But you actually have to analyze the environment and figure out what do you really need to change. Um, it's much, in some ways, much more difficult than what it used to be. Even though we used to consider the change management programs we were running as very difficult, this is more challenging. This is our way of showing Chris's pyramid. Um, when we came back from the session, we loved the pyramid, but we have the leadership development group at Oracle uses a pyramid to show the leadership transitions in your career. And so we knew putting a pyramid out there wasn't going to work for us, so we had to make it into blocks. And then we changed the language a little bit, although I think it's pretty much the same, um, to really make the points that would really work at Oracle. So that's what this page is. We even have a build version of this um, where you can – build it, and when some of our consultants will actually take away some of the, the lower parts and show sustained performance running off the chart and everything, so they've played around with this a little bit. But as a minimum, this is, this is the model that, that we use to explain what agility is, and you can't get there if you don't have the other pieces in place. We've also played around with this one quite a bit. Um, the managing change always had a piece of it that was trying to change people's minds. But with agility, it's, it's really important. The changing mindsets is really important. There's a changing mindset just about change itself, which is what we liked that earlier one about episodic versus continuous. Um, really changing mindsets that are going to drive different behaviors, different practices, and this is evolving over time. It's, and it means you have to know about what's going on in your environment, and you need to get into a place where you can anticipate what's happening and your mindsets related to whatever part of the business you're operating are in that stage where you're, you're looking at the environment, you're anticipating the change, you're making continuous changes. At the same time, some of the managing change approaches to solving problems are very, very valuable. We're not throwing them away. What we're trying to do is be more nimble about it, um, limit the scope, figure out what do you actually need to change here and which one of these change things do we really need to do? Not the like, I think Chris, Chris I think Sue called it Chris, um, I think Sue called it 17 steps or something and ours was 34. So, you know, you really need to figure out which one of these do you really need to do and, and for this situation at this time. So we continually come back to this graphic because we really like it, the episodic change, continuous change, and we, we at various times will talk a little bit more about it. Um, and our separate tools by phases, by phases, it's called out here, our practices were not fast. This idea of the overlapping transitions and being adaptable is really key. 
this page is showing you, this is kind of a complex page. This is showing you something that we provide as a tool that consultants may want to use. We found it to be very effective to figure out where you are today and where you need to go. And you can use this type of a layout to assess your current state, to identify future, to communicate the change to people. And it can start some really deeper work about a particular area. We tried out the, um, the, our building agility um, solution on ourselves. So we actually ran it through the OD consultants. And some of the things that are on this page even are things we're looking at, like the focus on adaptive learning is really changing how we deliver learning programs. Um, that support group down at the bottom is actually a client support group within SUN. But we have that transition to become more advisors and less of an expert. So there's a lot of different things that are going on, moving really fast, making our solutions agile. Very, very big challenge for us as a consulting team. What we really try to, and this is one we use towards the end, what we really try to hone in on is that these bullets on the right side are the things that are really important to pay attention to. Clarifying what you need to change in the mindsets. Identifying what must change now so you don't, you can get very focused ensuring the timeliness and speed on the right things. That's, it's really key. Going fast in the wrong direction is not going to get you anywhere from a business perspective. Um, simplifying our change practices and involving people. So what has worked and what are our challenges? One of the things that has been working really effectively is changing that language about agility and changing people's expectations about agility. Um, associated with that is probably the challenges that you see on the right side. There have been so many agility articles coming out. So I'm showing a, um, some research that was done by our virtual information services group. And I asked them, you know, I feel like every time I turn around there's a significant agility article that comes out. And some of them, different parts of the business are floating around, and whether it's HBR or McKinsey or who it is, they've got these really meaty articles about agility. And so I said, is it how, what's been going on? And they did some research, and they showed me how many articles are coming out. And right now it's about two a month, um, which is really hard to to handle. So how do we get ahead of that? How do we get ahead of so many articles? They're defining things differently. They're using keywords differently. They're making different recommendations. So this solution was our start at getting this into a language that, you know, we could use at Oracle. Definitely one of the things that's happened is there's been a lot of enthusiasm, people taking initiative related to this. We've seen participants re-examining what they do and whether or not they need to do everything they do. Um, and we've also identified some business clients that are ready for us to do some more work with them. On the challenges side, those first two I've kind of talked to, one of the biggest challenges is even as we take them through this and talk about changing mindsets and talk about scanning your environment and talking about figuring out what you need to do, they want to come out of the session with, here's the top five things I have to do, and then I'll be agile. And it's, it's just, that is just really, really difficult. They're still looking for a quick fix. And in some cases, they, this is something that involves, um, you know, making some cultural changes, and it's harder to put those into a list of the top five. And then culturally accepting that fast doesn't equal agile. It's what you do quickly. It's doing the right things quickly. It's, you know, having a way that you can figure out how to do those right things quickly. Um, it, the business has all, the Oracle business has always been about speed. The computer industry is about speed. Your competitors are going to get that new thing out the door, and they're going to capture the market, and you'll be in catch-up mode. So there's a lot of speed built into how people see the business. And we fight that all the time. They want to see how can we do it faster. So one of the things we actually use early in our solution is talking about what is organization agility. And we settled on using two quotes. One is from McKinsey back in 2009. 
this one is appealing because it's more quickly than competitors, and that's you know that gets their attention. Um, the Chris Worley one is the real thing that you're going after is the organization-wide capability to make timely, effective, and sustained change. And so we talk about how you get what you want in the McKinsey space, how that really has to happen, and translate that into you know what Chris is looking at. So we talk about how you have to monitor the, the external focus, focus, external forces, how you have to ensure maximum surface area coverage, um, how your operating model needs to be the right one. And operating model is something that Sun tends, uh, Sun Oracle tends to use instead of the terms organization design. They tend to call it their operating model, which is actually um, – you got some advantages because so many groups I worked with before Oracle, if you said organization design, they thought structure. Um, if you say operating model, Oracle is, is thinking about all that area in the star. Um, some of them are more educated in that area than others, but it is much broader than structure. And you need a multi-directional approach. Um, you need to have unbiased business information flow. Those are some of the things we are struggling with quite a bit. If it's moving this quickly, how do you get the right information in the right hands without overwhelming people with all the information that's coming? So we've been toying with that picture that I started with earlier about our stack. You know, what are our offerings? And people have wanted me to stick organization agility in there as a step somewhere in that it's a layer or something. Um, I don't see it that way. I think it surrounds everything else. And we need to have timely, effective, and adaptive solutions. Any of these that we are offering, they have to fit within the business context, they have to be as nimble as they can be, and they need to solve the problems the business must solve now. I mean, those are just really key things for us. And we're looking at some of our solutions, where, you know, which we thought were pretty nimble, but we actually need to go to a new level of nimble, and we need to know which are the right ones. As we're doing that, we're changing all of our stacks. So I'm showing one, this is our emerging, you know, what do we offer? The one on the left is, you know, the organizational agility wrapped around the OD stuff. That's just a draft. We're just playing around with what is this going to look like now? But we're also redoing both stacks, the talent management piece and the development programs and consulting. Everything is changing. And so we put this offering model out, I think, about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. And we're making some pretty big revisions to it right now. And we're trying to, as an OD consulting team, be agile, um, be ahead of where things are going, anticipate what's needed in the business. Okay, so I don't remember if we go back to Sue or Chris. Chris, <laughs> 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 or you can go back to both of us and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> okay. Free for all. Free for all. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, get, I did get a, a quick question on the uh, on the chat, and I want to be sure and address it because I think it's something that, that comes up a lot. I'll I'll throw out a, a in case in case people can't see it. Uh, Mary was asking about the leadership side of changing mindsets, and I'll, I'll throw out you know our you know, our, our kind of research-based sort of answer to that, and then maybe Becky has some, some concrete ways of thinking about it. But if the way I, the way I, would, I would answer that question is think about all the things that, that Becky just talked about in terms of what the, what the group, the OD group is trying to do, and all the systems that they are uh, affecting, including, you know, the leadership development programs, as you can see on this particular slide. Um, think about all the things that are changing. Um, it's not that, you know, any one of them has to be designed for change. Any one of them has to be, uh, uh, you have to assume that any one of those is going to be changing. Uh, they're never going to be sort of stuck. And that, that's absolutely true, I think, for leadership as well. So our traditional ways of thinking about leadership, um, what uh, one author calls the romance of leadership, where we think about uh, leaders being at the top of the organization and, and they're the ones that know it all and see it all and have it all and, and tell us what to do, that too, as a definition of leading and leadership, is going to have to go away. Um, we've been sort of playing around at the center with ideas around shared leadership, distributed leadership, responsible leadership, these different 
words are now showing up. And it's not, it's not a top-down mindset change anymore. It's more of a collective and shared mindset change um, once you get into the agility mode. It, it's not a top-down thing. It's a, shared, it's a shared conversation about how we change mindsets. Having said that, and I'm going to ask Becky if she's got some concrete examples at, at, at Oracle. Having said that, there's this they still got to make this transition. And that's, that's sort of the paradox. You have to get the organization to, you have to get somebody in the organization, often a senior leader, to say, we're going to shift. And that's a pretty dangerous and threatening idea because everybody who got to a leadership position probably got there using the old model and now somebody's saying that that way of gaining power and direction and control in the organization is going to change. So there's a transition part that has to happen. I think that's where uh, Sue and I use a lot of that uh, self-design model. And then there's a maintenance part, and that's where I think the, uh, the uh, engage and learn model really helps people think about uh, changing mindsets as a collective issue. Um, Becky, any particular uh, stories that you can tell or, uh, and share from the, from the way leadership has thought about uh, change at, at Oracle? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's specifically a story, but I can kind of generally talk about it. I think we've always, we being HR people, OD people, we've always been encouraging empowerment of employees. Um, and that was always a good way to manage the, org the leaders that did that more effectively. Their groups tended to do better. Um, you know, so that's always been there in the background, but this is different because the intellectual property of the company is resident in those employees, and they're the ones that are catching the trends and seeing what's going on based on whatever capability expertise they have. We have to provide them the freedom to chase the opportunity without always checking up above and without checking all the way up the company or whatever. And that's something we're really struggling with right now. Um, the, the people that are not at the upper echelons are saying, can you give me more? Tell me more about where this is headed. Can you, t you know, they're, they're like asking that question where we're looking at, hey, you're the ones that know this. How do we free you to get together and yet still move in the right direction? So how do you get that sweet point, or I don't know if it's sweet spot, um, between how much direction you receive and then you can go, anything that's not in the direction, you go proceed to make that happen. How do you get that balance right? And it's really tricky. It's tricky for an individual manager, but it's tr tricky for an, a line of business. And, and we're kind of grappling with that right now. That's one thing that we're really trying to figure out. How do we do this better? And, and how do we show examples of where it really works? Um, I, I think that's the same thing you're talking about. But, yeah, we're definitely yeah. – that is a big change yeah. in what it means to be a leader and what it means to be an employee. I think the, the other piece, too, is, as you said at the beginning, what, what works in your favor is there's an identity. Part of, part of Oracle's identity is wrapped up in the decentralized notion, right? So you're trying yeah. to get all these lines of business to run and go and fast. And yet, you also just being just being decentralized, just being empowering, won't get you the coordination. And so yeah. the the uh, the identity has to be more than just we're decentralized. It has to be uh, we're decentralized because we believe this X Y Z. You know, we have to figure out what that is. That becomes the control, and that's a top management responsibility. They have to give that direction. They have to help set that set that identity so that there is some ground rules, there are some guardrails so that the, um, uh, the decentralized lines of business don't blow, you know, the whole organization apart going in different directions. Yeah, and, and one of the challenges is that it is moving so fast, and they don't want to set yeah. something out there that is obsolete in a month and is sending people yeah. in the wrong direction in a month. It, it's just a really big challenge right now for how you be a leader in this. And I think it really Perfect. fundamentally changes the role of OE people in the organization, uh, organizational effectiveness people, because um, it, part of the role becomes really sort of having the ear to the ground about what's going on in different places and knowing when things are becoming um, 
too variegated and, and aren't supporting uh, an overall business model, and when something's happening that the rest of the organization really needs to learn from quickly. And I think that's a whole new set of activities for organizational effectiveness. Yeah. Be uh, Becky, there's, there's a question uh, about you're making major changes in Oregon leadership development. What are some of those changes, and how would you describe the shift in portfolio of skills that the leaders need to, to know? I, I'm not reading the whole thing, but it's there, yeah. and I wonder if you could talk about that a little. I think the one, the biggest thing for us is trying to find out, you know, we have these leadership programs where people travel to a, one location and everybody has it together and all of that. We have quite a few of those. They're very robust. There's various levels of that. Um, but what we're finding is the business wants to have a leader who's facing a challenge and they decide they want to know more about X, Y, Z, and they want to just know it now, and they don't want to wait until they attend one of those programs. They, they may even not be able to spend the money to travel. So we're trying to come up with these compartmentalized approaches, and we're trying to look at and we're experimenting with various ways that they can take a virtual class, although sometimes virtual classes don't really work. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, what type of virtual class? Is it a YouTube? Is it a YouTube and three articles? Does it include assignments? We ran an experiment um, last fall where we had this leadership challenge that Sandy, one of the people that worked on this solution with us, she had an Oracle leadership challenge, and every day she put out a challenge and people could then respond to that particular day's challenge. She gave them a few things to do for, that could be done like in a five or ten minute time frame, and then discussion. And that just caught on like wildfire. That was really effective. It was almost too effective. It actually pulled our systems down the, like the third day. <laughs> we, had to, we had to figure out how to be more robust about it. But um, it, it really, it was clear that there were people who wanted to engage in the moment in learning about this particular thing that I'm really grappling with right now. So we're trying to figure out that piece, not you wait until it's the right time and you go to a leadership program, but how do you have this continuous learning where people are working in their daily whatever they're doing and they have a way they can go in there when they need it, when it's relevant for them, and get what they want and do that in a nimble fashion, but not leave out the important stuff they would need to know. And we're really, we're really looking at this. This is a like head scratcher right now for us. <laughs> and, and, one, uh, and one group call it is, uh, how do you figure out how to do just-in-time training instead of waste-of-time training? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get there it all figured out. There was also a question, Becky, about uh, diversity and inclusion, and how does that, if, if it, at all, factor into how you think about agility? I don't think we've factored it in directly. If we had an organization that, you know, was particularly dealing with that, um, Oracle's a, a really global company, and they're very good at taking advantage of the talent regardless of, you know, the diverse differences. And um, don't see that as something we – you know, there are definitely going to be pockets where somebody's working particularly in that area. But the openness of the Oracle, the social network, and the openness of the forums that we're coming out with, it's like people's voices are being heard, and that does provide a fair amount of inclusion, and it does result in some very diverse participation. I think probably our biggest issue with diverse participation is language. And I was reading an article recently about these the coming language translation things that will be in your iPhone, boy, could we use that? Um, because everybody's using English, and it's not, it's not natural for everybody to use English. And I'm probably not directly answering that question, but that's probably the closest to the diversity piece that, that we probably deal with. And I think if I'm, I may have the wrong um, impression, but my impression is that many, many of the change teams even the teams in your own group as well as the teams that you're working with are very virtual. So yes. you're dealing with this constantly in your process capabilities, if, if, if nothing more. Yes. And that's true in the business, too. Yep. It's yep. not just yep. – I mean, we call the business, you know, our clients that are operating the Oracle right. business. Right. It's right. very true for them. Yeah. And whatever – and when we – I mean, we have done things on a virtual call – that have to do with like MBTI or 
or strengths finder or whatever, that we always used to think you had to be face-to-face -face for those things, but face-to-face -face isn't an option, and we've got people from different countries and people from different areas, and we have to figure out how to do those things in a different way. The other thing I'll add to that, too, is I think diversity and inclusion, like change, like uh, leadership development, I think these are really interesting concepts because they, they, they demonstrate these two, these two issues that we've tried to, to uh, bring across in this seminar. There's the context setting, right? Is, is diversity and inclusion, is, is a new way of thinking about leadership, is a new way of thinking about change built into that context? Is it built into the design? of the organization on the one hand, and then on the other hand, is it, is it built into the way change happens? Is it normal? Is it expected? Uh, do you see diversity and inclusion as a way, as a strategy of getting things done, or does, is it set aside as an objective and we're trying to see if we can, you know, figure out how to get more of this and people with different attitudes and, and stuff, or is it embedded? Um, the more it's embedded, the more the notion of diversity and inclusion is embedded in the way you do things, you build in, uh, you, you automatically build in more, um, more solution ideas, more brainstorming, more ways of looking at a problem, and, and you get that, uh, that flexibility in your problem solving, uh, collaboration, cross-functional coordination, that becomes a natural part of the way you do business, and it, and it helps you change. And the next, the next question that came yeah. in actually leads to sort of um, the summary learnings that Chris and I have had. It, it, it is a question of is OE a dot connector with a broad across, uh, knowledge across a wide variety of expertises and domains, and are there challenges in businesses where deep technical expertise is valued? And um, I think the dilemma for all of us who are trying to figure out how to weave this into the organization is that OE is not broad and shallow. It is deep and broad. And that that is really quite a challenge and, and leads to uh, companies really needing to take very seriously how do they develop that capability. Because whereas Becky's not describing a world where the, her group of 40 virtual people, the group of 40 virtual people are doing all the designing and they're managing all the change, that's not what she's describing at all, She's describing a world where they are constantly figuring out what the business needs and introducing the right interventions from a very deep knowledge base. I think um, it, Becky is nothing if not extraordinarily well-read and educated about this and constantly keeping up with uh, what's going on in the world. And um, I would say is, is my prototypical deep expert organizational effectiveness professional in fact, one of the reasons Chris and I love working with Becky, besides she's great to work with, is um, <laughs> we learn from her constantly because she's yeah. out there trying to figure out how do you actually make this work. And, and she and her teammates are developing um, interventions constantly to try to deal with the, the nature of the environment that they're facing. Um, on, on this slide right now is um, kind of what we've been learning about OE and OD professionals and... Um, uh, we've learned the import and, and, and what an organization needs to do to really embed this in, in the organizational capabilities. And um, we've learned that it re does require compatible models and frameworks and perspectives to reinforce continuous change and redesign in the organization. That's exactly what Becky described. And you know, she described the tip of the iceberg of what they've been developing and what's in their toolkit and what they make available both passively because um, – uh, uh, line, line managers can go directly to it or actively because they have clients and they're providing the consultation and coaching about what to do. Um, but it's a really deep knowledge of, process, uh, of the process of organization design and change that they're bringing to the organization. So I don't, I don't think that the companies that say, let's just get a toolkit are going to get anywhere with it because I think it really depends mm -hmm. on that, that deep knowledge. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I think the uh, the deep knowledge is something that, uh, that again, like Sue said, we've been playing with Becky around for the last several years and, 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 and talking about this, and there's there's other people who we've done this work with that, uh, through the center and, and the sponsor network. Um, they're, they're, they're not 
it's not they're not scratching the surface. They're they're really digging in and and trying to figure out the skills, knowledge, frameworks, processes, and building an integrated uh, toolkit that fits with their identity. It fits with the way they're thinking about it, and it's not just a it's not just a pull it off the shelf kind of thing. They're 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 customizing it to fit with their organization. And if I if I take that the I go back to the engage and learn model. Um, the question from Adele really sort of gets after that, right? You're the dot connector. That's the that's the awareness part of that model. It's not that awareness and design and um, tailoring and monitoring are, are 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 linear. They're all happening all at once. And I think that's the great part of the the description that Becky just gave was you you see them being aware of what's happening in the business and listening and reaching out not just in the business but in the external environment about who's doing what and 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 how they're bringing it she's she's in there helping people think about design she's in there and she's got her group in there helping people figure out how do you make this work for you trying to figure out you know is it working and 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 gathering data quickly so that they can make adjustments so she's designing the the OD function to be nimble agile and adaptable She's trying to use that, that center of excellence to help the organization and the managers in the organization design their organization in a more agile, adaptable way. So it all sort of begins to fold in on each other, and, and it, you know, you, gotta, you have to understand that system. I, I just chuckled, Becky, when you said they want to leave the training with the five things they've got to do. And <laughs> um, it, agility is not simple, and, 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 and yet managers want simple. And it's sort of our job to try and understand the complexity and be able to help them make first steps, second steps, third steps that, that lead them in the right way. That's what the role of the uh, COE has to be. And, again, I think you designed it really well. Becky, any last comments because we're reaching the bewitching hour here? Reaching that, reaching that hour, yeah. yeah. Not any that come to my mind. Thank okay. you for this opportunity. I always – See what we're doing when I have to present it. <laughs> <laughs> and so do we. That's what we learned from you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. thanks, Chris, for yeah. joining us in the evening from France, and thanks to all of Absolutely. you who have supported yep. the center. Thanks to everybody and, who joined us. And um, who are interested in this work. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And uh, if you're available, we'd love to see you in June. Come and, come and visit and chat about this some more. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.